uh, to get involved with this. It says this. It says, uh, anyone interested in a free ride in a helicopter flight for four people, we're still looking for two more people to join us. Uh, we're going to leave early on Saturday, the 31st. And uh, they're going to go into uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, where we'll have a breakfast, aerial tour of the city, and then board a yacht for a short cruise and lunch. And they're looking for two more people here. Uh, we'll do a flight along the coast. I keep saying we, I'm not. Uh, they'll, you'll fly uh, along the coast and see the Jacksonville, Florida port before flying back home. If you're interested, please email me. And so you'll want to get this if you're, I don't know if anybody here is getting interested. It says uh, to be sure and email them. Uh, preferably, it should be someone with a helicopter and a yacht. <laughs> Other, otherwise, otherwise, we can't go. <laughs> it's amazing what you get in your computer, isn't it? All right. Okay. Let's um, let's look at Mark chapter six. If you will connect, uh, or just look at verse seven for a minute of chapter six, where Jesus called the twelve and he sent them out two by two and he gave them authority. He called them, he sent them, and he equipped them. Then uh, when you get to verse 13, it says, uh, it's kind of a little summary here. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So in between is what those 12 disciples did. Now, if you skip over to verse 30, verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. So the verses 14 through 29 is a parenthesis. All right, this, is, this is where we learned about uh, King Herod and uh, his, his wife Herodias, uh, the daughter and the uh, murder of John the Baptist. So we saw that last time, but that's a parenthesis. So you, you kind of jump in, in uh, from verse uh, 13 right to verse 30. Okay, and that'll tie those two together. And that really makes a, a lot of sense. So we come to a very familiar uh, story. It's not a parable. It's a real story. It really happened, just like Mark says. Uh, in fact, it's the only miracle that's recorded in all four Gospels. And uh, what's interesting, and we won't have time to do that now, but uh, for your own personal study, you look at all four accounts because you learn something different in, uh, about uh, from each account. The same account, but each person saw it from a different viewpoint and was led by the Spirit of God to record certain things. So it's very, very interesting. I want to divide the story into three sections. One, we're going to look at the divine side of the story. Then we'll look at the human side of the story. Then we'll look at the combination of the divine and the, the human side, which I love and think it's the key to this, uh, to this story. So uh, there's going to be, first of all, a time of accountability. Verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. It was report time. I don't know if you can just imagine. Here are these 12 guys. They've been out. We're not sure how long they've been gone. But they've been out uh, and doing what is recorded there. And now they're back. And they want to tell Jesus. And I don't know if it was you. I, I want to tell Jesus first. You know, my, my story is better than his story. And you can just see the excitement. Imagine the excitement around Jesus as they began to share all it says all that have been done all the good stuff they told him all the failures all the disappointments they just shared everything with him all the doubts and all the victories as well and, uh, and one day it's going to be report time for us folks uh, the bible says so then every one of us will give an account of himself to god romans 14 12 they're going to be a, a day of reporting for us with uh, with responsibility comes a accountability and the great parable 
in Matthew 25, which is so clear, uh, where the, it gave some five talents and some two and some one, but all, all of them were accountable for what God had given to them. God, there's some things God doesn't expect you to do. I don't think he expects most of you to teach the Faithful Friends class, but he does expect me to do it. That's accountability. That's accountability. You'll never be accountable for not teaching the class if that's not what God's called you to do. But there are things that God has called you and me to do to which we will be accountable. I think, I think uh, uh, taking one of those boxes back there and packing it, you're going to be accountable for that. Why didn't you take a box? You got to fill it. Why don't you take two or three? I think there are some things that you will be accountable for that I will not be and vice versa. But there will be a time of accountability when each of us will give an account to God. Now, look, uh, rest letter B rest was not always available this is uh, what they had in mind it says and the disciples returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught and he said to them come away by yourselves to a desert place and rest a while for many were coming and going and they had no leisure no time even to eat there was no leisure it's not wrong to rest, right? It's not a sin to rest. Someone has said that if we don't come apart, we just may come apart, right? And that's true. But they, there was no leisure, no time to eat. Um, he said, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go away to a quiet place, a desolate place, and rest a while. Um, not forever. You rest, but not forever. Just a, a little while. Sometimes I hear people say, well, I'm just taking time off. I used to teach. I used to serve. I used to, but I just need some time, a little time away. But sometimes that little time becomes years and they never get back at it. Jesus said, we're going to, we're going to go away for a little bit of time here. And uh, they needed to, they didn't have time to eat. They need to have, uh, there were constant interruptions, constant interruption, no privacy. Can, can I say, let me just share this with you. You, you know this already. Um, if you're in the, if you go to a restaurant after the morning service and the pastor and his wife or the family are there, uh, stop by and say, hi, great message. Thank you. Talk to you later. Don't hover over them. You know how many pastors eat cold meals? Because six families from the church showed up at the same restaurant, and each one stopped and spent five minutes. And uh, so, so here, here, they didn't even have time to eat because of the people. The crowds were there. They kept coming and going. And notice they were, they were in a desolate place. Now, they take off in a boat, for many were coming and going. Verse 32, and they, they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. And so the disciples and Jesus take off in the boat and uh, verse 33, now many saw them going and they recognized them and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. They got there before the boat got there. Probably to make that work, they stopped somewhere out there and Jesus did spend time with his disciples. And uh, when they finally got to, <clears throat> to land, uh, the people were already there. Now, this uh, is the interesting part. Uh, Jesus uh, responds to the crowd. Um, this is an interesting uh, miracle. I mentioned it's the only miracle repeated in all four Gospels. Also, it is the, the material witnessed by the greatest number of people. And it is a miracle that uh, uh, touched the largest amount of people involved in the miracle. Well, they, um, they're on their way. They get there. The crowds are already there. And it says uh, that they ran and they beat the, the ship there. Verse 34, and when he went ashore, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd. What did he, what did Jesus see? In, in general, he just saw a great crowd. He saw 5,000, we learn later, 5,000 people plus women and children. A huge, huge crowd. How did he respond? He says he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. He responded with compassion. Compassion 
Real compassion can be seen on the outside because what we see touches our heart and we have to do something about it. Wherever you see compassion and Jesus and compassion, something always happens afterward. He had compassion on them. Something inside responded to what he saw. That's true of all of us. Something inside responds to what we see. We look around, we see each other, something inside causes us to respond. We look down the aisle in a church and there's a whole bunch of people and we see them and something inside causes us to respond. Compassion causes us to respond in a compassionate, loving way. Well, he responds um, with compassion. Now, what did, what did Jesus see in specific, very specifically? He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Sheep with no shepherd, they're hopeless. Sheep are hopeless without a shepherd. They will wander off a cliff. They will starve to the, they, they are, they, a, a sheep live a dangerous life without the shepherd. And what did Jesus do? He began to teach them. He began to teach them spiritually. He began to deal with them. And then in a, in a, a little bit here, the second thing he did is he fed them. He fed them, that's physical, spiritually, he met their need physically. He met their need. And then one more thing, a third thing, which we will see later, is that he enlisted others in this miracle. He had partners, the disciples. What a thrill to partner with Jesus. Well, he began to teach them. These people had been taught before. They'd been taught by the scribes and Pharisees, but what did they teach them? They taught them religion. They taught them ritual. They taught them rules. They had never been taught by a shepherd. They had never heard their teacher say, I'll lead you beside still waters. I'll restore your soul. Never heard the, their shepherd say, I'll, I'll help you lay down in green pastures. I'll walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. This is the first time they heard the shepherd talking. And what a difference it must have made as they listened to him as compared to the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus was looking for a quiet place, as were the disciples, a place to rest, but they didn't find it. Now the human side of the story, verses 35 and 36, it says, and when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, this is a desert place, this is a really an empty, forsaken place. And the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy for themselves something to eat. They respond, um, it, it, they are just, they are just gonna rest a while, right? Just gonna rest a while. And um, I, I think they expected the rest a while to be longer. It was pretty short. Now what did they see in general? They saw a crowd. They saw the same thing Jesus saw. Same crowd, same thing, almost from the same point of view. They saw a desolate place, as you read the, the, the verse, they saw a desolate place. They saw that it was getting late. They saw and realized that they were hungry, and if they were hungry, so the crowd was hungry. They saw that their vacation was interrupted. You ever have, have your life interrupted for Jesus? They were tired. They were disappointed. They were, I'm sure, looking forward to a, a quiet time alone with Jesus. And here were people, people, people. Somebody said the ministry would be great if it wasn't for people. <laughs> it would have been great that day if it hadn't been for all the people. They had some great plans. Well, how did they respond? What was their solution? They said, send them away. Send them away. What was... What did they see specifically? You know what they saw? A problem. 
a problem. They were disappointed. Something had interrupted, people had interrupted their plan. What did they do? Well, here's what they did. They tried to figure out a way, tried to figure out a way that they could escape responsibility. Disciples, there's a crowd, you have a responsibility. They said, send them away. If we can get rid of them, we get rid of the responsibility. Hmm. After all, we didn't invite them. They just showed up. You see, they examined the resources. You know the story. They had bread and fish and money. No money. What? Five bread and two fish. And they held that up to Jesus, I think, and said, Jesus, that's all we got. This is all we got. And uh, it's impossible. What you want done, it cannot be done. It is impossible. We told you it wouldn't work. And you have two things there, problem or opportunity. The disciples saw a problem. Jesus saw an opportunity. What do you see? What do you see? It's always a question. We deal with that every day, folks. Every day, practically, we deal with those two questions. Is it an opportunity? Does God have something in mind for it? Or is it a problem? It's a problem. Disciples said it's a problem. Now you have the divine and the human sides combined. This is partnership, and I love this. I love this. From the human side, the disciples did what they could do. What did they do? They found a boy. Uh, John talks about this a little more in his account in John 6. They found a boy with five loaves and two fish, and, and the boy was willing to donate it, to give it to Jesus. And so the disciples, at least they did something. They found some food somewhere. And uh, the second thing in John 6, it makes it very clear that uh, Jesus had the disciples organize the people. Uh, verse 41, verse 41 here, um, it says in 40, and they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, and they, taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, and he said, blessing, and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and uh, set them before the people. John indicates the disciples had the, it got, instructed the people how to sit, and then they distributed uh, the food, and uh, they divided the fish up among all of them, and they all ate and were satisfied. So the disciples had a part. They found, they found the little lunch, and uh, they also organized the people. Um, in verse 43, they had another job, and they took up 12 basketful full of broken pieces uh, and of the fish, and those who, who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So they had a two, two couple jobs there. They were partnering with Jesus in this miracle. No, let's pray. Jesus didn't need them. He wanted them. He, he, he could do everything without us, but he wants us to partner with him. Now you have the divine side. Jesus did what they couldn't do, of course. He, uh, he uh, took those five loaves and two fish, and he multiplied them. Uh, you see, little doesn't matter to God. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Little doesn't matter to God takes a little bit and feeds 5,000 plus. And the result is that verse 43, they not, they not only were all fed, but they had leftovers. And the leftovers good. Like left, the best Thanksgiving dinner is the one next day. Isn't that, isn't that great? Now let me give you some basic observations. I got four or five of them here. Number one. I think that we spend far too much time telling God what we don't have and what we can't do. And that gives us the opportunity to avoid responsibility. 
That excuses us, we say, or think, from involvement. Five loaves, two fish, not enough. No money. We don't have what it takes to take care of this crowd, so let's get out of here. And Jesus says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want to do something so big. I want to do something so great. I want to perform a miracle like you have never seen before. And guys, you're going to miss it. I wonder how much we've missed because we saw a problem and not an opportunity. I thought about Moses. Moses stood facing dead on the Red Sea. And God said, all right, get ready. I'm going to take you across. And uh, I don't know, maybe Moses said, wait a minute, God. I don't know how to build a bridge. I don't know how to build a boat. I don't have any wood. I don't even own a hammer. I don't have any nails. God says to Moses, what do you have? Well, I got that rod. Is that all you got? That's all I got. Do you know what? That's exactly what God needed. Exactly. You see, little doesn't matter to God. I thought of David as he stands before Goliath the giant. And God says, David, it's your task to take that big guy down. And David says, wait a minute. <laughs> I'd like to do it, but I don't, I don't own any armor. I don't, uh, I don't have a spear. I don't have a javelin. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to use a sword. Never used a sword. I don't think it's going to be a very fair, <laughs> very fair fight. Well, David, what do you have? Oh, I got a my my old faithful sling. It almost wore out. I use it so much. Uh, I got some stones. Is that all you got, David? Yeah, that's it. Just a sling and some stone. And you know what, David? That's exactly what I need. Because little doesn't really matter to God. And here we are in Mark chapter 6, 5,000 men plus women and children, and they need to be fed. And you say, wait a minute, we don't have enough food. We don't have any money. We're tired. We're wore out. We were on our way on vacation. And... Uh, Jesus said, what do you have? I, what do you have? Oh, I got the five. The, those, you know, I keep telling you, five loaves and two fish. That's all. You know what? That's exactly what I need. That's exactly what I need. There's a great passage, and we'll do this. Uh, Second Corinthians, that just I have never forgotten after I read it one time because I, I said, boy, that's, that's it. That's it. Eighth chapter of Second, Second, uh, Second Corinthians. What did I tell you? If I didn't tell you that, don't believe it. <laughs> Second, Second Corinthians 8. Uh, notice the cha if we had time, the whole chapter is fantastic. But he begins and says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that's been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in severe test of affliction and abundance of joy and their extreme poverty, they've overflown in wealth of generosity on their part. They were taking up an offering. And I think Paul had said to this church, you don't have to give. You're poor. Look at it says their extreme poverty. You know what it is to be in poverty? These folks were extreme poverty. That's worse than poverty. And yet, as you read the text, they wanted to give. They said, no, no, we want to be a part of that offering. We want to be a part of that project. And uh, the, one of the keys in the, the story is in verse 5. It says, and this is, was, it was not expected. 
but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. And that's the key. We give ourselves to the Lord first and then all the rest of the giving flows out of that. We try to do it backward. And that's why we get frustrated or we walk away and say, I can't do anything. But they gave themselves to the Lord and out of that flowed their generosity. But here's what I want you to see. Verse 12. For if the readiness is there, you, they want to do this? It is acceptable. Okay, God said, I'll accept it. You want to do something? According to what a person, uh, according to what a person has, not according to what they don't have. God doesn't say he wants you to do something, but you don't have the ability to do it, or he, won't, he hasn't planned to give you the ability. He said what counts what counts, not according to what, uh, what he had, but what he don't have. See, little doesn't matter to God. And these people didn't have anything. They were extremely poor. They couldn't say we got a lot of money in the bank. They probably didn't have enough to feed themselves the next meal. For the readiness is there. It is acceptable according to what a person has. What do you have? Oh, uh, Moses had a rod, okay. David had a stone, okay. Disciples had uh, five and two, okay. Not according to what he does not have. We cannot excuse ourselves because of what we don't have. Number two, God longs to partner with us in ministry. God longs to partner with us. Jesus said to his disciples, uh, would you like would you like to partner with me in feeding the five thousand? Yeah, fantastic. Well, go get those loaves and fish and bring them on over and get the people seated. We partnered with Jesus. They organized the crowd, but they almost they almost missed the whole thing because they were going to leave. I believe the whole story, one of the, one of the major stories of the Bible is partnership. Partnership. Abraham, I'm going to do a great thing. You want to partner with me in this? Oh, yeah. Moses, I'm going to do some big things. You want to? Yeah, I'd like to partner with you. David, Elijah, Peter, you and me. God, God's doing stuff all over the world. And I think he's doing so. I said, you want a partner? Yeah, I want to partner with him. I, I, can't, I can't go right now, but I can give. I can pray. I can take a box. Huh? Number three, if anyone went away hungry from the feeding the 5,000, it was their own fault because they had enough for everybody with food left over. Sometimes, you ever leave a service and say, man, I didn't get anything out of that message? Boy, the pastor was way off this morning. Oh, maybe it was me. There was enough food there. But I didn't eat. Maybe it was me. Number three, number four. Jesus prepared more than enough. He always does. He's got more than enough grace. More than enough forgiveness, more than enough promises, more than enough peace. He always prepares more. He always prepared more than enough. Now, number five, number five. I want you to notice it says they all ate. They all ate and were filled. We often use this for, for world missions. Suppose the disciples had gotten the food and given it to the first two rows of people, gave them all some bread, then went back and got some fish, gave them all in those first two rows fish, went back and got some more bread, gave it to the first two rows, went back and got some more fish, gave it to the first two rows. What do you think the rest of the people would be saying? Hey, what about us? We need some fish. We need some bread. You know that over 90% of what most churches are involved in is all local. And there's a whole world out there saying, we're hungry. We're spiritually hungry. We haven't heard. We keep giving the gospel to the same people week after week after week. 
when there's over three billion people who haven't heard yet. It's a great missionary passage. Well, the whole story, I think we could sum up in maybe three words. Opportunity, well, that's, well, let me just say that this is what I love about Woodside. Woodside has a vision for the world, right? They have, a, they have a heart for the world. They have a heart for local stuff. I had one last night doing the Thanksgiving boxes, talking about having dinner in your home for, uh, for the neighbors and all that. They're, they're interested in local, but thank God they, they have a large percentage of their heart is, is global. is global for people at the back of the crowd. They're not on the front two rows who are still hungry for the gospel. I think you could, we can sum up the whole story maybe in three thoughts. Number one is opportunity. Opportunity. We're surrounded by opportunity. I just mentioned three. There's more. Surrounded by opportunity. Number, the second word would be the word partnership. Partnership. God's, God's doing things. And it, we can look at it and say, well, it's a problem. No, it's opportunity. This isn't the greatest meeting in the gym, but it's an opportunity. We're together. We get to talk to each other, touch each other. Some of you even let me hug you beside my wife. <laughs> Partnership. And the last would be making sure that everyone gets to eat. Making sure that everyone gets to eat spiritually, locally and globally. Great story. Read it again. And then look at it, the other three accounts. Okay, let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you that we get to hear the gospel. We got to hear it in the spirit of God spoke to our heart and we opened our heart to Christ and to the salvation of the cross. Help us never to forget the last rose. Those who are hungry, they've never heard once. Help us always to be generous and gracious in our giving and our praying. And God, show us, show us here and now the opportunities. Whether it was last night in the trunk and treat, whether it's having people into our home, picking up a box, getting ready for Christmas and the things that will open up to us here to bring people. Father, we're, we're surrounded by opportunities. We want to see them that way. We want to partner with you in seeing people come to Christ here and around the world. Thank you for our class. Thank you so much that the uh, church and the leadership has said, you guys can meet together in the gym, just be careful. Thank you for their vision and for their heart. I pray for them. I pray that you protect them, give them wisdom, I pray. Help us to understand even in times when we don't understand what they're doing, we trust you, we trust them. Okay, now, Father, give us safety. Thank you for keeping us safe from the virus. And we pray you'll give us safety today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.